on today's episode oh, of the glue guys oh, oh Ryan. <laughs> We're, Ryan are we struggling Mike the Warriors game sucked yeah it was that was bad can we talk about it yeah let's talk about it welcome back to the glue guys this is Mike here say hello Brian <laughs> Check us. Oh gosh, it's that kind of day. Check us out on Twitter at BK Glue Guys, NatsDaily.com, The Athletic. Get yourself behind that paywall at theathletic.com slash glue guys. Brian, Michael, the Nets. No drop. Are no, no drops. Are flailing. Oh, yeah, there's no drops. That was that hello was a um, that was symptomatic. There's a, there's been a couple. There'll be a few symptomatic things on this episode, Mike. I'm a little bit swollen, you may notice, if you're watching on the YouTube. <laughs> Shout out to the YouTube. Um, I feel like the way I'd describe it was, um, you know how that movie Unbreakable, you know? Like, sure. You know how, like, yeah. anytime something bad happens to one guy, another guy, you know, that's sort of what I did to myself. It's like the Nets played bad, and now I have a really bad hung- hangover. <laughs> that's... You are the Nets voodoo doll? Yeah, exactly. Is that essentially what you are? Pretty much. <laughs> yep. uh, the It was a disaster. So, Brian... Uh, we're gonna get an inside perspective. Brian was at the game last night. I was there. Tell the people sort of your environment, weird. what you were operating in. It was so weird. I mean, not the like the, the whole oper- like the whole game was just weird. The the environment I was operating in was weird. Everything about it was weird. <laughs> um, yeah. Through shout out to Socios, we had like that like box deal thing, which is I've never sat in anything. It was like super that. cool. What if you if you didn't see over the weekend? socios which is a, a company that advertises like with a bunch of teams they reached out to us to hey they were like hey you want to give listeners of your show two tickets yeah to the nets game and they we we did ran a little promo over the weekend and then brian yeah. you know, frankly if we're gonna unveil this here on the show and wow. the conversation was that brian and i would go to a game together <laughs> and and what happened was uh, Brian just grabbed the tickets and left? You know. <laughs> well, the guy, the guy wasn't budging. He was just, you know, it was just this Warriors game. That was it. I couldn't. I tried to get the Knicks game. You see, you see what I was doing, Mike? Yeah. The conversation was that Brian and I. I was. I live. People don't know. I live in Washington D.C. Now we talk about it sometimes. We don't talk about it all the time. I like to represent that I'm like still a New Yorker, but I'm just a a Beltway elite yeah. at this point. No yeah. longer a Brooklyn elite. <clears throat> but. Um, <laughs> And and I was like I, I I talked to my wife and I was like I'm gonna drive up, I'm gonna stay at Brian's apartment. We're gonna go to this game, and we're the Knicks game. Mike, That's this should still game. happen. We we can just go get tickets. We're not. Yeah, we can. <laughs> <laughs> like, this isn't dependent. No, I wanna I wanna uh, you know how I like to operate with our friendship, which yeah. is maximum transactional, guilt. completely yeah. transactional. <laughs> I understand. So give us the in. Can I ask the first? The first thing I have is that Twitter was. Uh, Non Nets Twitter was all up in arms that people were chaining MVP for Steph Curry. Dude, what it was, was that moment like in the arena, the weirdest crowd because they weren't like, it wasn't like Warriors fans. It certainly wasn't a lot of Nets fans. It was just Steph Curry fans. So it was like nobody was rooting for anybody <laughs> until <laughs> Steph Curry would hit a shot, and then everyone would go, "Whoa, oh my god!" It was just, it was cringe and weird. I hated the environment from from, from start. To, I felt bad that like Mina Kimes was. In the audience, because like I, you know, that's a weird game to to go to. Also, because it was just like a disgusting blowout. Um, so there's that. But uh, yeah, it was just like Steph. I think it was just Steph Curry fans, which I guess is its own sort of <laughs> subgenre of, of fandom now. Um, so for that reason, it was pretty tonally vibe vibally weird for sure. And and so this is a funny thing that continually happens now. It's it, the part of the experience of the Nets becoming this national televised broadcast team. Is that then you have the comments from the Knicks fan base who are like, this type of of treatment would never happen in the Garden. Right. The snake pit that is the Garden. It would never, ever happen here. Yeah. Which, you know, across the East River, which is probably true. It wouldn't. But I think it's, I mean, I you obviously don't want your fan base cheering for a, another team's player to that degree. The thing I like about going to Nets games is that the environment isn't this, like, insane uh january i've talked about it before january 6th energy of like <laughs> yeah <laughs> like this all these like this cabal of crazies i like that when you go to nets games it's it's like we are we're just appreciators of the great game <laughs> just, of basketball we're just just high-minded just 
lovers of art, really. <laughs> it's art lovers. Yeah. Um, just appreciation of the game. The, yeah, the I would have liked. I would have liked a little pushback. I'll be honest with you. The, <laughs> <laughs> little, I'm trying. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah. Yeah. A little pushback would be the problem. Is there? You know, a lot of a lot of new fans. A lot of new fans to basketball. They don't know like when to sort of complain about stuff. When to when to push back. So um, when to literally push back. And literally, punch people. Yeah. In the face. And uh, yeah. and so it's a you know they're going through. A learning experience and exercise were patient, but yeah, in you know, I would like it if there could be a few nexuses of, of not January sixth, <laughs> yeah, not January sixth energy, but a couple of pockets of of rowdy energy would be would be welcome. It, it was a very strange game, and we'll get to the game now because uh, actually, like beyond the Harden and KD, neither of them had the like an incredible game. Harden was had his prior i think it is his lowest assist total with four assists on the game kd had one of his lower point totals which is 19 points it is least efficient yeah. shooting night all year because the warriors are the best defensive team in the nba bruce brown had a good game and just about everyone else like i'm not going to count kessler edwards nine minutes as like <laughs> i'm not, not going to really talk about them well how oh, weird man. was it that they existed or that Com camp thomas played the entire fourth like do you feel like we kind of gave up on that game really quick yes yeah, yeah. Like, what, it, what was and that? the nets actually won the fourth quarter which is what's funny if you look at it the, the right. nets scored 23 points and the uh warriors yeah, put that on your whiteboard golden state yeah 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 <laughs> so the nets really got it yeah um that what a weird fourth quarter that was because there was like Kaminga, and it was Gary Payton the 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 mitten yeah this is called Gary Payton <laughs> That's too good. I hadn't heard that no. yeah um it was a, it was it was a tough game to watch as excited as we were maybe going into it uh it, it was kind of obvious that the the Warriors were operating at a higher level they are the best team in the NBA I don't think there's any question right now about that Steph Curry is. You know, him and KD are going to be battling for MVP, I think, all year. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a big moment, uh, a big head-to-head -head battle, and Curry was, <laughs> a, like, a, a mate, like so insanely the perfect Steph Curry version that you expect that uh, it was jarring. Yeah. A and then the rest of the team, like, they just have a bunch of, like, Andrew Wiggins was super impressive. Um, he scored 19 points, a 7 from 11 from the field. I really wasn't ready to reckon with, like, Ugh, am I supposed to like account for Andrew Wiggins now? Right. In this environment, I don't think so. Um, going forward, it, <laughs> it's yeah, like that's my vibe. That, is that it's not that always rest. that's not always a thing. Yeah. What What was your take while you were sitting in the arena? I was just sort of stunned at the energy at how fast we like folded folded our our board up and went home. Just like the, the Camp <laughs> Thomas minutes were were came out of nowhere, um, and I guess I didn't like. You know, it was pretty quick by the time that, like, the game was out of hand. It was basically over the course of, like, you know, the third quarter. And when that happens, it's like, yeah, I feel like, you know, th things go up, they come back down, you know, whatever. Uh, but I guess, I don't know if Steve Nash talked about that decision at an any length, but, like, that felt pretty, that just felt weird. I was like, why, why is this happening? Um, I don't, you probably didn't get this because you were in, you're obviously in the arena, so you're not hearing the commentary from the TNT crew. Mm -hmm. But it, it Parts of the second quarter and parts throughout the game, the Warriors were running like a triangle and two defense okay. against Kevin Durant, where they basically were double teaming Durant and then zoning behind him. Mm -hmm. um, and it would like definitely screwed up Durant for a portion of the game, got him out of his rhythm. I will say Bruce Brown, that's where Bruce started scoring. Like a, he had like six points in a row or something for right. the Nets. Um, he that's the thing I love about Bruce Brown is that like he recognizes that the way I kind of beat the way I fit in is just by being super active and diving in, uh, diving into the paint and trying to get the ball in there. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, what was going on with like why LaMarcus Aldridge didn't play all that much? Yeah. I don't like he only played nine minutes and he, he shot the ball only three times, which has to be one of the lowest, you know, sort of production points that he's had this year. Yeah. Like he barely played. Obviously Patty played a ton in place of Joe Harris. Um, it didn't fully work out. I, I I don't it was just an odd game overall. Like there wasn't any consistency at all uh from the Nets from top to bottom. Yeah. Uh, I mean a lot of people uh and I don't yeah, it was a weird game to be like experimenting so much with your rotation in that way and giving <laughs> up so early. But um and also like if I uh, just reading through people's comments on the Discord, shout out to the Discord, invite in the Twitter yeah. bio and in the YouTube description. Uh, a lot of people talking about and on, on Nets Daily in general 
like, what's the deal with Claxton? Because if we're going to do this drop coverage stuff that we've been doing on defense, like, this is not not the team to, to pull that S with, Mike. Uh, you know, you want something a little bit more switchy if, if, you can, if you can manage it. And Claxton is, you know, switch daddy. So... Like let's let's get let's where where is he? Is What's that how you is that his name on the street? <laughs> yeah, the Switch Daddy. Switch Daddy, not a bad it name. It's pretty dope, babe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I might steal that. Um, but yeah, so like, and where's what is happening with Claxton right now? Why is he? Why can't he touch the floor at all? I don't know. Because he's sick. Is he just sick? Is he a mono? What is going on? Well, he here? was wearing. I mean, he was still wearing street clothes. He, you know, he wasn't <laughs> suited up for the game. Right. I mean, I guess he was literally suited up. For the game, he it was, but he wasn't wearing game clothes. Um, I, can we get an answer? I, I, I mean, I don't want to pry too much. I mean, I understand HIPAA. I understand. You, do you respect HIPAA? Privacy. Do you respect? I HIPAA? respect HIPAA. I respect it, and 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 also Peppa the pig and HIPAA the pig. Um, <laughs> but sorry, dad joke. Uh, I don't understand how we don't know what illness Nick Claxton had. I don't know of any illness. Respect that man's HIPAA, Michael. You do that. You respect the HIPAA. <laughs> what? He's a he's a 23 year old. So it's either mono. It's meningitis. It could be meningitis. Bacterial meningitis. Yeah. I don't know. The, I don't know the meningitis is that well. <laughs> Me either. I, I, Me I either. didn't. I don't want to joke about it because I actually think isn't that what it's a serious? I'm not, one? I don't want to joke about it either. But this is crazy. I mean, I Tell do us what. Joke about it, but. Tell us what's happening. Yeah. What's happening to? Because this team does particularly with. Like obviously Joe Harris being out doesn't affect Nick Claxton, but it makes the team just a little bit thinner, and it would be nice to have some Nick Claxton minutes against a team like the Warriors, where they do have a lot of athleticism, and ball handling in the perimeter and with their bigs with Draymond, a guy like Nick Claxton could have been, you know, a nice piece, and we're gonna get in this after the break. I have a concern o meter oh. for this team, and. Your boy Blake Griffin, Brian, is just never going to be a pick and roll big. He he is a he's a pickable big, but it's a pick and pop, and that pop is is not very poppable. It's, yeah, it's on the low end. He's still a a popcorn kernel that yet to be popped. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I agree. He's one of the worst three point, and I, I have statistics. One of the worst three point shooters in the NBA at this point. Sure, probably the worst, uh, frankly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I it's it's like it's damaging. I think it is a little bit damaging to lose this game in the way that they did. The lack of competitiveness, the fact that KD had his worst game of the year, that Harden couldn't then supplement the level of play that KD... Like, Harden did get to the free throw line 11 times. Hit, and that's where he got most of his points. Ten for, He hit 10 of those 11 free throws. Um, but the, the fact that Harden couldn't then try to make up for what was happening to KD is like a little a little painful yeah and not having joey harris is going to have an impact while he's out because <clears throat> as much as people love to make fun of joe harris and hate on him mm -hmm. he's kind of important super important for the Brooklyn well Nets. also mike we did win a bunch of games going into this game do we care about that at all do those do those games against those schlocky teams matter well yeah so do you do you feel like it, those wins were that great <laughs> the Thunder, the Thunder and the, Pelicans game. The, I, the Pelicans game was super were tight. Great wins, great capital G. Are you pumped about winning wins. three straight <laughs> against the Magic, the Pelicans, and the Thunder? I'm glad so, they didn't lose that Pelican. The, the Pelicans yeah, they game was tight. That was stupid, all, all the way throughout. And the Pelicans didn't have Brandon Ingram, Zion Williamson, <laughs> and I don't. Was Devontae Graham even playing? He was like, I don't even remember. He was in the house, and that's yeah. you know. And for that reason, it was Garrett close. Temple got 36 <laughs> minutes. I'm going back to that game. I never to, Tomas Sadoransky, who had been, and this kind of leads into my conspiracy theory that the oh, Nets are going to trade still for Jonas Valanciunas and Tomas Sadoransky. Um, Sadoransky didn't had really played all year, and he got 16 minutes in that game. I think they're trying to feature him uh -huh. uh, to the Nets PR staff or uh, personnel staff. Got it. So yeah, yeah, okay. So the Nets, on the whole. Yeah, they they are a very good team. They were tied for the Eastern Conference lead <laughs> going into this game. I think they were tied, or maybe a game and a half, or a half game back from the Wizards. Uh, but we're we're what are we are victims of the moment, man? You know, mm -hmm. we 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 react to what we're seeing. We're doing this on Wednesday. The Nets are going to play another game in eight hours or whatever, and they'll probably beat the Cavs. And if they lose to the Cavs, then we're like really everyone's stressed and mm. worried and we're really freaking out about it um are you 
before we get to the concernometer for these individual things, which we'll get to, your worriedness level after. I mean, you saw it live. You saw the carnage live. You saw basically the, you know, the surgery in person. Them take out the brain and <laughs> fiddle around yeah. and then um, put it back into the person's head. Oh, man. Because that's how surgery works. I, I don't want to get, I don't want to feel like this is dramatic, but I, I do feel like, I do dramatic. feel like getting getting Claxton get back in the rotation to where he actually like is playing and succeeding and it's meaningful is it should be a priority. It, I, I hope other people feel that way. I don't know why where people are at with that. Also, gotta say we are missing it's your boy touch football expert <laughs> extraordinaire Paramus touch football league champion um, Kyrie Irving. It's, Look, let, it's let's, a bit of a problem. Let's let's do that. Let's because there's a Kyrie bit about the concernometer that I want to talk about. And Steve Nash said something last night before the game that I I I love Steve Nash dearly, but I I don't get this mentality and the way that he speaks about it. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about that coming right after great. this break. And we're back, Brian. Wow, great to be back with you here mm -hmm. on the Blue Guys podcast. Go to iTunes, rate them five stars. Well, we even want to have them. <laughs> This is, mm. we have no drop. This is Levels of Concern. <laughs> levels of Concern. I am going to try to bring out different topics, things that Nets fans could be concerned about, about this team. And I'm going to try to relate it to real life, things that concern you, maybe give you anxiety, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, on the low end scale, it's drinking too much coffee. You know, that feeling. I hate that feeling. When you're a little too shaky, you didn't drink enough water, and you drink too much coffee, yeah. you're like, ugh, I went too far. Yep. And then, to me, my biggest level of concern is climate change. Really? Uh, that's, I'm that's, pretty worried that's about it. What you can fret about? Wow. Well, that's pretty worried. It's kind of noble, you know? Anyone else worried about that? <laughs> Adam McKay is making a whole movie about it that's coming out with for, Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence. For me, it's uh, like I have to return, like, my aunt Helen's phone call. Like I, like I, it's been a, it's been two weeks now and I didn't return the phone call <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, fuck. I, now it's too late. And yeah. My comparable to that is my, my, when my grandmother sends my kids, their great grandmother, which is a big deal that she's still around, uh, sends them like a little gift. Uh, and then my mom texts me three weeks later and says, Hey, did you write that? Thank you. Yeah, card? exactly. The thank you note no. is, that that's worse than climate change for me. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. It's not even close. It's so much I'm worse sorry, than climate change. My grandmother's I'm sorry, I'm just like completely disrespecting <laughs> my ninety year old grandmother's like yeah. just sweet the, the the her one connection to her great grandkids. Yeah. Uh but that's that's sort of what I meant by calling Aunt Helen back. That's more like the thank you note is more accurate. That's yeah. the worst yeah. that's the worst anxiety in your life. That's number one. It's that'll be the thing that like if I'm like tossing and turning at night that I'm like you're just such a fucking loser and you didn't even write that thank you <laughs> note. <laughs> you know yeah. that's why I love when uh, celebrities talk about like they'll talk about how Tom Cruise is this really you know you're trying to what's the anecdote that you can tell about Tom Cruise that's not really actually of how he is mm -hmm. how he's a maniac I'm sure mm -hmm. he always sends me cake on my birthday wherever I am it's either flowers or cake he always remembers it I'm like. Yeah, because he's super rich and he just tells. Yeah, he's got an assistant. You know, he's got a. If uh, I yeah. really, the only difference in my life, uh, if I became a billionaire, would be that I would send thank you cards. I think that's the only th change. At yeah. This point, because we have everything else we want, Brian. We have this podcast. That's exactly right. right. Uh, let's start off with Kyrie Irving because that's what we tease coming out of break. Okay. So, uh, on the level of concern, <clears throat> the big bold question I'm asking you is Kyrie's continual absence and whether he will return to the team. I mean, I, I, it's climate change level concern for me. It's, it's. I don't think it's happening. Uh, well, I think climate change is happening, mm. but I don't think Kyrie is going to return to the team. Uh, and I believe they're going to have to trade him to some team that is super desperate, like the New Orleans Pelicans. I, this team could really greatly use Kyrie. I can just tell. He tweeted out another Matrix meme recently, mm. uh, like you know the green computer waterfall graphic mm -hmm. um computer language waterfall graphic and i don't think he's gonna budge <clears throat> brian how concerned are you about Kyrie's absence i went through i did turn. i did the thing you're not supposed to do and i doom scrolled through the replies on that latest uh tweet that he did um yes <clears throat> and yeah. our, our our take stands 
it's, and it's getting more and more reinforced. Every time you go through, anyone who's like, yeah, man, it's bigger than basketball, do you? Warriors fan, Lakers fan, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> Knicks fan. I, I look in your bio. I see what you're tweeting about. To a man, it is a. It, I have not seen one Nets fan in those replies yet. Not one. I mean, that's not true. But, <laughs> but the vast majority are from fans of other teams. So I am. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm calling BS on all of the well wishing from from any Warriors or Lakers or Heat fan or whatever in in your replies. Um, yeah, I mean, I Brian wanted to get together the Apollo tweet drop because <laughs> during, yeah, it was yeah. yesterday or two days ago yeah. I tweeted at Kyrie Irving just the eye the shifting eye emoji right and people everyone within the replies were saying what was happening you know thinking like there's what I was trying to do is I was trying to do a counterbalance to all those Warriors fans in Kyrie's replies saying it's bigger than basketball I was trying to stir him a little bit and be like here are the eye emojis like Maybe implant, incept him with an idea mm. that he should get vaxxed. That to me, that's that. Wow, I'm that just, just, is way more involved. I thought you were just trolling. I, this is... it was, it's really a troll, but it's <laughs> yeah. also because I feel like Kyrie is the type of person where if you can slightly change his perception, then he like goes off on a. He is a someone. Inception train. would work on on Kyrie Irving for sure. You can <laughs> you can plant that in a dream. Um, ooh, how do we do it, Mike? Is there is there a real Inception? There's got to be a way to do this. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's just a Facebook meme. We just got to get the perfect Facebook meme. We have to like just really yes. nail it. It's ooh, let's we'll we'll do a bit. Um, um, but yeah, my my threat level is midnight on this as well. Um, yeah, threat level midnight. It is. It is uh, increasingly just knowing how these people now they're all dug in and stuff and like, you know, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's headed in the right direction, um, and we're going to be faced with a decision. I mean, all to make. You saw Steve Nash was like, "I talked to to Kyrie Irving, but never about basketball. Like, that's not what we're talking about." This is insane yeah. to me. So what this else is do you the guys thing have I wanted common? to talk about. Like, <laughs> okay, okay. So let's think about this for a second. So they they have conversations. One, what the hell are they talking about? Like, are it are they talking about uh, the rules of touch football? Is that is are, is he sending him? Cut ups yeah. of touch football, like special plays you could run mm -hmm. on that format in Paramus. Probably, you, you know, you, there's there's so many things that they could be talking about. You know, the thing that Kyrie Irving really loves, I believe, is basketball. You know what Steve Nash should be loving is basketball. Like, I don't understand. Like, I don't think one Steve Nash is being fully authentic, and I love Steve. You know, he's I'm a fan of his coaching. I'm a fan of the way he runs the team. <clears throat> And I'm going to bring up Steve Nash's coaching as a level of concern mm. later in this episode. But, like, why not talk basketball with someone who played the same position as you, you coached him for a year, and he obviously has this deep abiding love for basketball, even though he's deciding that his distaste for vaccines is higher than his love for basketball. Like, well I, here's like, send maybe, him text him about basketball. Maybe he's playing a long a long con here, Mike. You know, if you're in sales, you just you can't come in and beat him over the head with the with the opportunity of the new uh, I don't know frying pan that you're about to get sure. sold. Yeah, frying pan. Right? You don't come in there hot with a frying pan. You, I mean, you, I almost bought. I did buy my wife a butter warmer. For, wow. for Christmas, Whoa. and one of those like uh, Scandinavian companies, it's an enamel. I, was it IKEA? Pot. Is that beautiful IKEA? No. <laughs> no, it's like Dansk or something uh, like that. Sure. Um, but she, my wife, was like, "I don't need a fifty dollar butter warmer." Ah, uh, got like, him. Good. Damn, <laughs> for Christmas. Yeah, she, yeah. A sad Christmas. It was a plum color. That's... I was excited about it. <laughs> well, bring it I was over like, here. You can I... heat up your cup of coffee. You can pour it. Did, you know, into the butter oh, warmer. Oh, I heat see. It up. For the weird coffee and butter things people are doing. Is she, does she? No, no, she no. Does that? You don't. It, it's called a butter warmer, but it has all these other applications. You could heat up chocolate. You know, you can make a chocolate. Like, sauce are you trying to sell it? me a goddamn butter warmer? Because I'll buy it. I swear, <laughs> I'll buy a butter warmer. Um, and she was like, "Mike, I have a microwave. I don't need a fucking <laughs> butter warmer." So but, it, but just think that. about it this way. You know, you don't just want to come in there and and start swinging and be like, you know, are we are we playing? Are we playing Nick Claxton enough? No, we're not. You, you got you to gotta <laughs> slow it up. Come in through the back door with a little, you know, I saw this Facebook meme. You might like it, you know, and work work him in that way. And then, you know, we get to like, hey, Cam Thomas played that whole fourth quarter. Like, that could have been you. You know, that's, that's where we. <laughs> Dude, it's so. So I think what Steve Nash is doing is I think he's he's. He believes that by saying he's not talking about basketball, it's showing that they still have this 
personal connection. And he believes that personal connection and the idea that it's not all about basketball will eventually recruit Kyrie back to the team in some way, right? Or to get vaccinated and want to come back to the team. What I think, like, I, I don't understand why you then can't still talk about basketball. Like, Kyrie's probably desperate to talk about basketball with someone. Why wouldn't he be? He played it his whole life. It's the thing that he loves. Steve Nash, send him a cut-up. That's how you get him back interested in basketball. You'd be like, hey, Kyrie, like, <clears throat> like, you could even say, I respect your choice, man. I respect mm -hmm. it totally. W what do you think of how Cam Thomas did play in that fourth quarter? I'm going to send you some cut-ups. I just want your... Your brain is what I want. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want that basketball brain. We got to go start back feeding that a little bit. We got to go back and watch how they lured MJ back from uh, his being in exile with his own version <laughs> of touch football in playing minor league baseball. You know, that's <laughs> that we'll we'll use that playbook. So maybe it, it may, yeah, literally, it's to start. Joe Sy should fund a touch football league, yeah. and <laughs> Kyrie should fail spectacular. Yeah. Not that actually, Jordan. He's okay. You know, he wasn't he's that bad. He was coming along. It is kind of incredible how much people used to like shit on the fact of Jordan as a baseball player when like how incredible is it that he went from not playing a sport for 10 years and then was like decent yeah uh, at it and baseball is the hardest sport just to be decent at it's a weird one you don't a, lot of, play a lot of muscle memory involved there um so yeah my concern is climate change uh big time yeah i got i got thank you thank you note to grandma levels <laughs> of fret Number two, uh, James Harden's play this year. Okay, we've talked about it a lot, so we don't have to go over it. Here's my big stat for you, Bri. This year he's averaging about four and a half attempts per game from the field within 10 feet of the hoop, you know, around the bucket. Mm -hmm. And he's shooting 53% on those shots, so not horrible. Last year, eight attempts per game within 10 feet. It's significantly more, and he was shooting 57%, an even more efficient percentage a little bit. on more shots. A little bit more efficient, but many more attempts on a season. Um, so one, I was I, I was buoyed by the fact that he was he wasn't shooting dramatically different in terms of percentage within ten feet, blah blah blah. Like because it would be a real fear if he was shooting forty percent on those shots. Mm -hmm. um, but he he is driving to the hoop significantly less. Um, it is an issue relating to whether he feels that there's any value in that shot because he knows he isn't going to be fouled anymore when he goes to the hoop. Uh, his play overall, he isn't as good as he was last year. And I, we are still grappling with that hamstring. I don't know what to make of it. Mm. It's as vexing as Nick Claxton's illness. I, I can't <clears throat> wrap my arms around the fact that a guy's hamstring is this, uh, needs this much repair mm. that is taking him this long to ramp up. So what is your level of concern with James Harden's play this year? Is it too much coffee? Uh, looking at your credit card bill and realizing, ah, shit. <laughs> there's, there's a little too much on that that's, bad boy. That's good. Um, the next one I have is, like, realizing your career path isn't going to work out. Like, <laughs> that's, you know, a like, big, like, that's a big one. Yeah, and there's a big leap between yeah. two and three. <laughs> yeah. And then four is pandemic. Yeah. And then five, I'd say climate change is still more pressing to me than pandemic, but. You know, I, I could I could oscillate between those. Um, those are awesome. Bit that is a big jump from two to three. I'm more if there was something between <laughs> credit card and, um, and career and can and your career's over is that would be um, that'd be where I am. I actually I, I'm more actually just in credit card land because I've seen enough of him actually doing like he has the ability to do the thing. I've seen like the glimpses of it, the the um, sure the small small tastes here and there. Um, and I guess it's interesting that he's not like relying on, I mean, you, you, that stat you brought was good and is, uh, kind of, Thanks, bro. yeah, it passes the eye test. And I think it makes a lot of sense that that's exactly where he's just not, not getting to the pain enough. Um, and you know, a reason for that is because presumably he can't get past faster guards, people who with more lateral movement, like he used to maybe, I don't know. That's well, yeah, it's yeah. that in the fouls. It's right. like he's a little quickness has been dropped off because of his hammy. Mm -hmm. And I'm laughing because it's like, again, the longest running hamstring issue ever. And the fouls because he he just isn't getting fouled at the rate that he was. Yeah. So he probably sees less value in driving to the hole because before it was like all he would do is shoot threes or just try to get fouled. Right. 
Um, yeah, he's having a harder time like keeping people on his hip like he used to, putting them putting them in jail in that way. Um, mm-hmm. So they're also like recovering faster too. I think like there's some I would have to look at some film of this or whatever. But that's sort of it. It feels like he doesn't stay open like he used to um, yeah. as he's driving. So I mean maybe this all comes back to the hamstring stuff. You know I I guess it does. But I've also seen enough evidence that like he's done that successfully. In some in some cases it's maybe like a sustained like he's got a. He's going to be constantly like throttling sixth gear, you know, in order to get there, and that's uncomfortable. I don't know. These are just weird guesses, um, but like it is a matter of just like, you know, it, it, yeah, it's just a matter of doing it more often than he's maybe comfortable with. I don't know. You know, I'd be interested. So Seth Part now of mm-hmm. the Athletic. Seth used to run the was used to be the director of like basketball research for the Bucks. He was the head analytics guy, um, and Seth was just now released a book. The Mid-Range Theory, which mm-hmm. is a great book about, you know, the, the stats and analysis and how all that has kind of changed ba- the game of basketball. And Seth does this incredible peer, piece for The Athletic where he tiers the top 125 players in the NBA. It's really good. Really, really And Harden, I believe, was tier like 1B. Yep. So 1A is like KD. And, um, and Giannis. It was just those two this year. Yeah. And, and Harden was that next tier. I wonder what Seth would think of where Harden is because before this season, Harden was firmly like the Luka, him and Luka were the two dominant sort of like triple double threat ball handlers who could take step back threes that could yeah. get fouled, get to the hoop, just control the game on every level. Um, Harden isn't quite that this year, though. He's still, I mean, he's still averaging like 28 and eight. Like, I don't, and it's it's not like a West, Russell Westbrook twenty eight and eight where it's highly inefficient. It's We're still efficient basketball. Twenty eight and eight, right? That's I just want to clarify. Twenty eight yeah. and eight, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> but he's he's a, he's a tier below what he was. Sure. So it's still an all star, but I don't think it's like this gravity defying, world wrecking force that he was right now. Right, right in this. And moment. if he's not what he was. And Kyrie Irving remains to be an anti-vaccine patsy. Ooh, then, there it is. <laughs> then um, that's an issue. That's mm-hmm. a concern. So I agree with you. I think it's credit card. Because that's the thing about a credit card bill, that it, it's a fixable thing. Mm-hmm. Y- you know, you can that's cut right. back your spending, you know, not eat out dinner four nights a week, cut it back to two for a, cu- a little that's bit. Seamless. That spaghetti that's at home. seamless. That seamless is going to really wallops you at the end of the month. Let me tell oh you. Oh, my God. Yeah. If you really that and getting coffee out, yeah, don't do that's it. That's what you, you can't. We stopped. Do it. I haven't gotten coffee out in I want to say years. I almost really never do it. Yeah. Oh my god. God bless you. God bless <laughs> I'm, you. I'm a real saint. Yeah, um, what can I say? <laughs> um, next one up. This is a big one, Brian. And we talked about this before, but this is really important to really dissect now. Blake Griffin, as the starting center for your Brooklyn Nets. Okay, let me tell you a statistic. Blake is shooting 17% from three, and he's taking nearly four attempts a game. So I looked at all the players who've taken at least 43 pointers this year, okay, which cuts out a lot of the people who've taken Baylor none, and those are the fairly consistent shooters. Mm -hmm. Blake is dead last in the NBA in three-point percentage for people who've taken at least 40 threes this year, dead last. And he's dead last by about 3%. There's, like, uh, people who are, like, Jalen Suggs, who's a rookie, who's taken a bunch of threes, and he stinks. Um, That, and we've talked about this before, what is Blake's bag? Three-point shooting is not in Blake's bag, right? I, I, It just, I don't know when we have to come to the grips with the fact that his bag is no longer, like, you know, if he had a pocket for dunks, that pocket's been ripped out, and if he had a pocket for threes at any point, that what? pocket has also been. You ripped think out. it's completely gone? There's no, there's no pocket there anymore. He's shooting seventeen percent. Yeah, but in like fifteen games, and he takes games. about four attempts a game. How, That's well, there's got to be. I get to see a, like a streak from re, like somewhere in the last three years where he's had like a fifteen game stretch of shooting like you know fifty percent or something. That's got to have been never, a thing. He's never been a good three point <laughs> shooter. I mean, I'll pull up his his career statistics right now. Yeah, he's now. been like like somewhere in league average or less in most years. Yeah, for, well, basically for most of his career until he got to Detroit, 
he didn't shoot threes because his right. game was so much about being around the rim and mid range. When he got to Detroit, he started taking about it's like he took like six threes, seven threes, six threes, five threes a game in, a in terms of that. Yeah. And his percentages were around 35 percent, 36 percent, 24 percent. And last year it was 34 percent. So over his career, he's the 33 percent three point shooter, which so, is low. Would you say he was shooting this season? It's like 17 percent. What was it? He's shooting 17 percent. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously <clears throat> that's not, you know, that'll be that'll. That's progress bad. To, yeah. You know that? yeah i do know that that's do bad want, i don't need that part of it you think that's a good percentage i don't think is it's a good percentage think? i just don't think that's the his permanent percentage that if you you know play out a whole season that'll be stuck at 17 percent. that's pretty low that's yeah it's pretty low I'm just, but you get what it's i'm saying i don't low. think it'll stay there and here's the killer thing when you're shooting that bad from three is that typically because he's the guy who should be rebounding the ball, if he's taking those shots, the Nets aren't going to get that offensive rebound mm -hmm. for the most part. It kills the possession on such a stark level. And teams, you've already seen it. They just they don't have too much respect for what Blake no, is doing no. on the offensive side of the floor. Let, let's look at Blake's game logs here, Brian. But, but, but and as I'm looking that up, you tell me. I mean, what's your concern level for Blake as the starting center on this team? yeah i think give it any 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 source of of concern that you have so i don't think i i would like to go back to um you know thinking about the rotation is not this like super set thing like i like having blake griffin on the team i think there's a lot of ways to deploy him super usefully him just locked in as a starting center does not that doesn't feel necessary at all um and it will feel a lot even more necessary um with Claxton back in a rotation. Um, not to say that like the Claxton starting experience was, you know, blew, blew my hair back because that, <laughs> that sure, that sure as heck didn't. But in a game like last night against the Warriors, you know, if we could just plug and play Claxton instead of Blake Griffin there, because I mean, Blake Griffin, I love him for his saggy D. He plays great saggy, sag, sag D. And that's what he's sort yes. of good for. He's, he can sag low off, off a of pick and roll and like bait people into taking uh, charges and stuff. Great. <clears throat> he's great at that. Um, but he's not able to close out on like a team with five super good, you know, rangy scorers. It's just that's that's he shouldn't be put in that position. So I think it's more for me, Blake being this is more of like a coaching decision rather than like a him personally. His three point percentage is bad, but I don't think it'll stay as bad forever, especially if if you tax him with less responsibility, just broadly speaking, um, that would be better for him. But. Uh, yeah, so I put that as a pretty low... Like, Blake Griffin doesn't super-duper stress me out, I guess. I, I call him Amex because he takes so many charges. <laughs> Jeez. Jesus. <laughs> you are on. En fuego. Um, okay, here here is the game log. So, after he shot, he got scored 14 points against the Raptors. He had 14 points and 11 rebounds. That was his best game of the year. He scored two against the Bulls none against the magic eight against the pelicans six against the thunder and four against the warriors and he's averaging about 22 minutes a game over that stretch so i agree i like his saggy ball d mm -hmm. you know i like the saggy ball defense that he plays takes charges he's a real glue guy Truly. at this point and we love glue people we love glue men and glue women yeah um and <clears throat> So I appreciate Blake Griffin, and I agree with you. He should always have a role in this team. The thing is, over the season, LaMarcus Aldridge has been much better. So, like, we've talked about that before, should he start. And Nick Claxton is hopefully going to come back at some point. And Paul Millsap's been out for a personal reason for the past few games. Um, but Paul has never really gotten a full – he's never had a consistent role in the team so far this year. And he wa did, last year with the Nuggets, had a consistent role. Um, I think he mo started most of the games and he was averaging about like 25 minutes per game, something like that. I just think we need to, Steve Nash, if there's any area you got to tweak, that's it's the center rotation and thinking about shifting LaMarcus in more as the starter to start the game, the guy to close the game. And when Nick Claxton comes back, you put more Nick in because as much as, as ill-fated as the Nick Claxton hard and pick and roll was to start the year, it is a thing that they're going to need. They're going to need that weapon. Like Harden becomes a better player when he has a pick and roll big to play off of. 
And LaMarcus isn't that, Blake isn't that, and Paul Millsap isn't that. So it's a problem, dude. 17% from three. <laughs> Mike, do you think he ends? He finishes the season at 17%? Is that what you're telling me? Can you honestly no, but, say that? Can you honestly say I, He's never been good at from three. He's not like Jeff Green, where Jeff Green has like an average year and a good year from three. Yeah. Blake is either bad from three or b- slightly below average from three. And it would be great if he starts hitting them. You think I, he, I would, su- you I think would support he ends him hitting shots. At 17%. That's what you're saying. I'm doing what you do. On the- <laughs> this is the way that you argue. The, the difficult <laughs> thing is he can't really do anything else for you offensively. Right. Mike, 17, Mike said, you heard it here first. Mike's locked in he's, at 17%. He, here's, he, he just doesn't. He's not an interior player offensively. No, not and really. he's not really a good mid-range player offensively. And so the thing you're hoping for is that he does hit these threes. Those are the bulk of the shots that he takes at this point are three pointers and he ain't hitting them. Mm -hmm. Um, And (laughs) if he continues to shoot 70% from three, like you believe he will, um, that's going to be a problem. (laughs) Uh, Last one for you, please. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll do two more and I'll make them quick. Nash coaching. Yeah. uh, Your level of concern. I I just think it's too much coffee. I, I actually have no concern about Steve Nash's coaching. Um, the, yeah. I mean, I, I quibble over the Blake Griffin starting thing, but I really don't have a great answer for it beyond LaMarcus Aldridge, but there's complications with him playing starters and closing minutes. I, there's been, like, you know, Matt Brooks did a really good film study on Bembry and Bruce Brown recently, <clears throat> and um, I think, I you know, we've we've talked about it, like, the this, you know, having Bruce Brown in the starting lineup is sort of a great idea, and Bembry backing him up has been really a boon. And so, like... I don't know. Those are coaching decisions. Like, you know, he's making the obvious choice. like, hey, let's let's beef up our perimeter defense like a lot of other competitive teams are doing. And they those two guys have been, like, um, amazing at it. Uh, so, like, I put, you know, that's – like, seeing Bruce Brown be like, that's a starter on a, on a like, super high-level NBA team is, a, you know, those are kind of out-of-the-box thinking decisions that Steve Nash is pretty comfortable doing on a regular basis. So, I mean, while there's, like, you know, we can – it's it's really easy to be like his in-game decisions suck. Like <clears throat> people do that with every coach ever, like all the time, and yeah, it's like an impossible ever. standard. I don't know who, who's like people point to as like the north star for like the best in-game decision maker, but I'm sure that he's got plenty of bad in-game decisions. So like you know that's that's all part of watching basketball is like you know b- being like annoyed with your coach. Um, but in general, I don't I don't super duper like pick on Steve Nash's in game decisions, and I like that he's like able to take. I like that he started Nick Claxton, and then like it didn't work out, and he and he's he was like not stubborn about it. He's like, okay, this isn't working out. Great, let's move on. That kind of yeah, stuff is important. And it, yeah, and and I the, my biggest thing with Steve Nash, which I really appreciate, is that I don't think any coach in the NBA would have navigated the Kyrie thing better than Nash did. Just look at how Doc Rivers. Doc Rivers is like the archetype for like a player's coach, a like. Obi Wan Kenobi type, sage like coach. I mean, he navigated the Donald Sterling situation better than anyone could have navigated Donald Sterling. And yet, the Ben Simmons thing is a complete disaster. Our Sham Sharani at the Athletic reported that he had a conversation with Rich Paul. It's not just reported. Rich Paul came out and said that uh, the 76ers are damaging Ben Simmons' mental health. Because they continually are, are pestering him Yeesh. about which doctors he's seeing and all this stuff. Like, the Kyrie thing is potentially even more explosive than what's happening with Ben Simmons. Because with Kyrie, yeah. you're adding in the layer of, like, the anti-vax mob. The political arguments yes. that are out there. And, and you don't get any anything out of this Nets locker room that's, like, anti-Kyrie. No. And it would be very easy to be anti-Kyrie. And as coaches... That's where the, it would come from. It'd be some grumpy Lionel Hollins type who's like, you know, basically cursing out Kyrie to reporters, you know, off the record to be like that. <laughs> this effing guy. You know, this effing classic, guy. Classic Hollins. Um, like even Steve Kerr, like him and Bob Myers did not handle the Kevin Durant, Draymond Green kerfuffle mm. Katie's last year in Gold State. It's yeah. partly why Katie left. He's, he said that to Draymond Green. Yeah. And Draymond said it to Katie that – they steve kerr and bob myers messed it up so i support steve nash Mm. um i think he's a very good coach i he has the best assistant coaching staff in the nba i would have to credit dave vanterpool and steve i think it's steve clifford right who's the 
old magic coach who's like an mm-hmm. assistant now, or he's like a advisor. The Nets have one of the are one of the better defensive teams in the NBA, and I think if we just said that at the beginning of the year, it'd be like, hey, the Nets are going to be one of the best defensive teams in the NBA. People be like, no, no, nope. they're not. No, they're not. And they are. Yeah. They statistically they are. Um, totally. So, and they do that without having like a great shot blocker, and they do it without being a good rebounding team. Defense is such a weird alchemy. You know, it's a weird. It's a. Mm. It's a. It's a witch's brew, Mike. I hear you. We've got enough Ravens beak this year. Uh, last thing. Mm-hmm. So, what's your? You have no concern, or is it too much coffee? For what's our, what we were talking for about? For Steve here? Nash's coaching. Oh yeah, not not really any concern. Okay. Last one here, Joe Sy. <clears throat> um, here's the specific thing: maximizing this team's window, and I mean that by saying, are the Nets going to use their 11.5 million dollar trade exception? That they got in the Spencer Dinwiddie five-way trade. Mm. So the Nets have the ability, and I know a lot of people know this, the Nets have the ability to take in a player who's on the last year of their contract who's making less than $11.5 million via the trade exception. Um, but to do that, it does add a significant amount of salary and luxury tax to the team. Mm. If Let's say they maximized it, $11.5 million, it would add that salary to the books, plus it would go and add like three times that amount for luxury tax, something like that. Um, so it would cost, I think, roughly, and I, I don't know this exactly, $40 million to bring in a guy with that trade exception if you're hitting that maximum number. $40 million of already playing a, a pretty high amount of luxury tax is a lot for uh, Joe Sy, as as rich as he is. Um I think there's almost no way that the Nets use that trade exception. Mm. Unless if it's for like a guy who makes like five million a year and they just like you know, they do it halfway and obviously that saves a lot of money. Here are just the names, just so we can kind of conceptualize of what that would mean. Guys like and I don't even know if they're injured, but they're whoever. Jeremy Lamb, Al Farouk Aminu, mm. Kyle Anderson. Tomas Sedaransky, oh, you're good. Delon Wright, Thomas Bryant. Um, so, hmm. I, I don't know. I think <clears throat> this. It just feels like it's not going to happen. Jeremy Lamb would be worth it, but I think he's hurt. Right? I, you know, like Jeremy Lamb would actually fit on this team pretty well. He becomes another shooter. He's a wing defender, um, but he's playing for the Indianapolis pace in the indiana pacers and no he's playing he's playing basketball games uh he's not really getting big minutes so maybe it would happen um i don't know what do you what do you feel those yeah i feel like you don't care none of those names excited me uh that you just rattled off and i don't think they sort of super move the needle you know the what like it sucks but the only thing that like truly moves the needle is a, a player of Kyrie irving's caliber um you know and that's 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 not an interesting thing to say. It's pretty tautological, but like you know, that's that's just sort of where we're at. Like I think we're sort of stuck in this particular tier. This sort of like I gotta say, I'm I'm in the championship tiers right now. I, are we like have we been demoted to like one B? Are we a one B team at the moment? Well, who's so who's the top of the tier? Is it just the Warriors because <laughs> they beat us and that's it's them all alone? Because. I mean, uh, let's go to the NBA standings here. Brian, new segment, NBA standings, brought to you by Standing <laughs> Sports Bar. Ooh, in the East standing room only at Standing Room <laughs> Sports Bar. All right, so the the top four teams right now in the Western Conference are the Warriors at 12-2, and two, the Suns at 10-3, and three, Dallas Mavericks 9-4, and four, and then there are actually three teams at 9-5, and five, the Jazz, Clippers, and Nuggets. The Eastern Conference is the Washington Wizards, number yeah, one. So insane. Mike, are you fired up about your Wiz? Fire, they're uh, they're like a really solid team. They're not 10-3 and three good, but they are. The, the Russell Westbrook trade has not been talked about enough where somehow via sending out Russell Westbrook, they've gotten Spencer Dinwiddie, Kyle Kuzma, Kentavious Caldwell-Pope, and Montrezl Harrell, who's like becoming one of the most beloved Wizards of all time already. Mm-hmm. And – to get all of that production on a team that like really didn't have anyone beyond Bradley Beal is really helped the team. So they're average, they're average, but they're, they're playing pretty well. Um, Wizards, number one, Bulls, two, Nets, three, Miami heat, four, and then it's Cavs, 
and Knicks. And then below that, it's like the Bucks are technically not even in the playoffs. If the playoffs started today, mm. uh, they're they're six and eight. Um, I mean, I, I I don't know. I, I, I even though the Warriors looked so great last night, um, and they're the best defensive team, and they have Steph Curry, and at some point, Clay Thompson is going to come back. I don't put the Warriors over the Nets like long term outlook. Mm. I mean, I still think if Harden starts playing like twenty percent better. I might, I might get remains. inspired to go back and watch the second and third quarters there and feel like if it was just a lack of ability to detect. I'm, I'm intrigued by what you're saying with this triangle and two situation. That sounds <laughs> that sounds compelling. Um, I'd be interested to go back and see if, if we did anything like unusual defensively to account for the fact that, you know, the Warriors are just a really weird and different, unique team that we were not used to sort of playing, on, especially regular season wise. Like, is that just like a weird knuckleball of a team to play regular season that you can just actually, you know, stack up for in some not complicated way in a, in a playoff series? Maybe. I don't know. Just some thoughts. Um, but yeah, I guess like yeah. when you lay it out like that, there isn't a whole lot of super duper concern, like heat of, you know, hit their spat of injuries that everyone was sort of expecting. And so they've kind of fallen off. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I, yeah. the the important thing to me, it's almost like too much to think about what a Warriors Nets NBA Finals matchup would be like because there's going to be so much attrition uh, so much, along so the way. So much riffraff. Yeah, but but look at the Eastern Conference. Like, let's look at the positive view of this. The Bucks are six and eight this year, and have a negative point differential of one point nine, which is, uh, that's not good. The 76ers have a massive, disgusting situation with Ben Simmons, and they're eight and seven, and they're fine. But that you know that was the other team that the Nets were competing with. The, the teams that the Nets are worried about right now are the Wizards, Bulls, and Heat. As much as I could love the Wizards, they haven't won anything. The Bulls are very intriguing and scary, but they haven't won anything either. They, they're ultimately going to be relying on a team with. Lonzo Ball, who has never done anything in his career. Zach Levine, who's never done anything in his career. Nikola, Nikola Vucevic, who's never done anything in his career. And the DeMar DeRozan, who famously, the minute he left Toronto, they win a championship. And then the Miami Heat. The Miami Heat are are scary because they have a bunch of tough-butted dudes. Tough butts. Who, <laughs> tough, a bunch of tough butts. A bunch of rough decks. Yeah. Um, and Lowry, who's won a championship. And Jimmy Butler, who's been to one before obviously with hero and bam and duncan robinson and you have pj tucker who's won a championship uh organization that has won championships a coach and a gm or a president who's won so that's scary but i much prefer this kind of weird top of the wizards bulls heat than like a milwaukee bucks team who's 12 and 2 operating all cylinders going for a repeat and the 76ers, who's in real F you mode and can get Ben Simmons back. Because I don't think Ben Simmons is coming back. Mm. I mean, the mm. mental health uh, mental health is not it's not an easy thing to fix. Whether you believe he has mental health issues or not, it's not. So he, if you don't believe it, he can just keep throwing this line out there as long as he wants. And if you do believe it, mental health tends to take a lot of time. It's a sticky it's, situation where you're invoking yeah. it and people are just like, I don't believe you. This is, this is a tough situation. Yeah. <laughs> that's I, that's a sticky wicket, Mike. I I tend to believe it. I, I don't that's, think That's the thing. It's like when you invoke it, you just you it's really a, a thing you don't want to come on the other side and be like, you're lying to me, and then you're and then they're not lying. <laughs> it's a pro- well, that's a problem. Yeah. And it's people typically don't like to readily admit that they have a mental health issue it'd be like, pretty it, it's pretty cynical um i i just started taking like a mild form of like an anti-anxiety pill oh, and i'm like in it when i yeah when i bring it up people like you get a look and i'm like i don't know it's just like aren't we all on drugs at this point I don't know, that's like, where that sounds like maryland to me that's out, out of here that's you know everyone's talking openly about their ssris it's like you know yeah, yeah. fantastic <laughs> yeah. i feel great about it yeah. it's been it's been an amazing change uh yeah. Uh, and I really had to do it, frankly, because the athletics HR department pulled me in. They were hearing how I was treating you, Brian, and they were concerned about how that I was uh, going to sue them into t- dust. Tyrannical, I've been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um. So your question, and I think it's worthy of a longer conversation, but we should wrap up now. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
are the Nets knocked out of their tier? I think they, the Nets are the victim of national TV games. Yeah. They lose on opening night to the Bucks, and they lost this big game against the Warriors. We're even kind of doing it. We're we're not even. But like, we can BTFO in these games, Mike. That's the part. Like anytime we play a good a good team. Although we did BTFO the Wizards before everyone knew that they were good. And beat, so and beat the Hawks. And, and beat the Hawks. You know, we, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I'm hanging on to some the world Hawks beaters. Victory. Yeah, we need to beat some better you know, teams, Mike, in order to feel too. super deeper comfy. Yes, it's important. So quick look at the Nets schedule coming up. They play the Cavs tonight. So if you're listening to this on Thursday. There's a reason why we're not talking the Cavs game. It would be lovely if everything goes well, though I'm a little concerned. I mean, it's a back-to-back, and I'm concerned about that Cavs game. I'll just be honest. Okay. Uh, they have, they have a, they're pretty good this year, and they have a decent amount of talent. They play the Magic at home on Friday. That should feel pretty comfortable and happy. Then they have the whole weekend off, and they go to Cleveland on Monday at Boston, ESPN game on Wednesday. And then they have Thursday and Friday off, and they come home in a huge two-game stretch of saturday nba tv against the suns tuesday night knicks nets on tnt um a huge stretch but a very kind of cushy schedule because there's a lot of separation after the back-to-back tonight there's a lot of separation between some of these games um and they're big games and you know they're the, the nets should be pretty excited to play them I would hope. Uh, and we'll see. Good. Good stuff, Mike. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Basketball. We did it. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.